In this video, we're going to look at thermal energy transfer, or basically how heat can transfer from one place to another, and something called a black body radiation. Um, basically, a black body radiator is something that absorbs all energy and then re emits it as heat. So, we'll look at what that does and how we can predict some certain properties about it. All right, heat transfer. There are three primary ways that you can transfer heat from one place to another one is conduction, convection, and radiation. Uh, you need to know these three and the difference between them, how you can actually use that to understand how the heat is, is moving. Well, the first here is conduction. Conduction happens if you have two objects that are in direct contact with each other. Um, but here, you actually don't need two objects. You could talk about conduction through a single material. So if you ever looked at like a spoon uh, in a bowl of soup, well, the soup is hot. Uh, but the spoon made out of metal is actually a pretty good conductor. So it isn't just hot where the spoon has entered the soup. Instead, that heat can creep up the handle of the spoon. Um, that's because the molecules, if, it, if it's hot, are just jiggling around. And the hotter something is, the higher the average kinetic energy of those molecules becomes. If they are moving around really fast, they are more likely to bump into other molecules, which then can increase their average kinetic energy and then cause that heat to basically trickle down the way. Um, so if you ever are roasting marshmallows, the marshmallow stick, if you're far enough away, you're usually fine. But if you were to grab like halfway up, you're going to notice that it's hotter halfway than it is all the way at the handle because the heat is making its way down through the process of conduction. Uh, conduction is also important in cooking. Uh, it's the reason that this frying pan has a plastic handle. So uh, if you've ever tried to cook in an all metal pan that has all metal handles, uh, if it's on heat for long enough, those handles can get pretty hot, even if they are not directly on the heat itself. So you might need to use special oven mitt to, to grab onto those metal handles because metal is a good conductor of heat, but plastic is not. All right, our second form of heat transfer is known as convection. Convection occurs when the fluids, uh, if, whether a liquid or a gas, move around during to a temperature difference. So hot air is going to uh, go up in this case. If I want to roast my marshmallow, uh, the best place to do it is right above the candle because hot air rises and cold air sinks. And if you look just at a candle, you can kind of see that the, the hot air is, is pulling that candle flame upward, but you don't really see the heat necessarily. Hot air doesn't necessarily look different than cold air, but there are ways that we can use thermal imaging cameras to, to see that, that change in temperature around that space. If I let a candle like this one, we can see the flame of that candle, but that actually isn't the whole story. That's the part of the visible part of the spectrum. That's the part that our eyes can detect. But if we look in the infrared spectrum, we see uh, a different story. In the infrared spectrum, if I do the same thing, I light this candle, we can see the flame that's there, but we also see a significant change in the, the area above this flame, that heat rises. Here I have taken a standard tea bag, just cut it and dumped out the tea, and then hollowed it out so that it's basically a tube. This is all a tea bag is. It's just a really, really light piece of paper. Uh, now I'm going to light that on fire and try not to burn down the house. Okay, what's happening here is it's heating up the air around it, and there's a convection current where that hot air wants to rise, and it's going to bring everything up with it once it's light enough. <laughs> <laughs> it will cause that tea bag to float up into the air because of those convection currents rising. So if we look at hot air and why hot air would rise, like why, why does this convection happen? Well, it all comes down to density. So hot air has a high temperature. That makes sense. We know from our gas laws that a high temperature results in a higher volume that temperature and volume are directly proportional, that if you increase the temperature, those molecules are bouncing around faster, pushing harder to increase the volume, provided that the pressure is the same. Well, if you know anything about density, 
Here we have the same amount of air, same mass, but our volume has increased. So the bigger the volume is, and the same mass will result in a lower density. And uh, if you know about how things float, an apple floats on water because an apple has a smaller density than the water. Well, air can actually float on other air. Hot air has a lower density than cold air. So the reason that it rises is because it's floating. It's floating on colder air. That, that hot air with its lower density goes up. We saw this earlier talking about how wind happens. Um, but this here, this movement around, we call it a convection current. Um, so hot goes up, cold swoops in to fill its space. And you see kind of this mixing of the air. So the heat is being transferred from low to high, but there's also heat being transferred just from the mixing in general. And we see this in some other examples as well, that the mantle um, in, inside our earth below the crust has convection currents that are happening. Um, so as the, the lower mantle gets closer to the core, um, where it's hotter, that mantle heats up, it increases its volume with the same amount of mass, and then floats on the other part of the mantle and rises to the surface where it can cool down and then make the cycle back again. Now, we can't really see this happening. We have different ways that we can um, experience that, know that this is flowing in this, in this way. But one way that we can see this sort of motion uh, a little bit easier is something called a lava lamp. It's a really nice visual of this convection current that is changing. Just like in the mantle inside the earth, um, down here uh, is kind of like Earth's core. It's a light bulb that heats up these blobs. Now, when the blobs get hot enough, they actually expand. When their volume increases, their overall density decreases because the mass inside them doesn't change. If they get hot enough to make them less dense than the liquid around, they break away and they float to the surface. Then once they get to the top, they have time to cool down. Their density increases again because their volume goes down and they float back down. And this process continues as long as the light bulb is on and the lava lamp is plugged in. Our third uh, transfer of heat is known as radiation. Radiation is going to be our most important heat transfer in this unit because this is the way that we get heat and energy from the sun. So radiation is just energy that's transferred by a wave. Um, we are not experiencing heat from the sun because we are touching the sun um, and is not traveling through the air uh, by molecules hitting against each other. So there's no conduction because there is a vacuum in space. Now, we are not experiencing it because of convection, because there isn't a fluid um, or a gas that is transporting that heat energy from the sun to the earth. Instead, Radiation, this wave, can travel through a vacuum, which makes it very, very important um, for us to be able to get energy from these external sources like stars or our sun. Now, we are all emitting radiation as well. Um, so here, this cat, you can see in a thermal imaging camera, is emitting this infrared radiation. In the visible part of the spectrum, cat's not glowing, but because it has heat that isn't zero Kelvin, it is emitting some energy in the form of this radiation. Everyone is. If you stand close enough to a person, you can actually feel the heat coming off of them. And that is the radiation of infrared energy. If I take these two glasses of water, they look pretty much identical in every way. They're both very clear um, and they're both just normal water. And in the visible part of the spectrum, that's true, that these are exactly the same. But as you can see in the infrared, there's a clear difference between these two. This one on this side is significantly hotter than this one over here. And we can see the difference because of the different wavelengths that are being emitted from the hot versus the cold or room temperature. So um, with these three forms of energy, we can see some different relationships that are happening. Um, in this picture, all three forms of energy transfer show up. Here in point A, this hand is off to the side. You can feel the warmth of the candle even if you're not right above it and even if you're not touching it. That is the radiation energy from the candle. Most of it is in the form of heat or in light that you can see it. 
uh, from a distance, but you can also feel its heat if you're close enough. B is feeling that candle because of the convection currents, that hot air rising. That's why it's hotter on the top than it is on the side. And then if you're holding a spoon, it's kind of hard to see there, but that's a spoon. Holding a spoon, you can experience that heat from conduction as the heat energy travels down the spoon, those molecules bumping into each other. All right, so we're going to shift gears and really only talk about radiation from here on out. One of the most important parts about radiation is how that radiation can be emitted because the energy has been absorbed and it heats up. So thinking about a car, and you've maybe experienced this before, if the car is in direct sunlight, um, certain colors will affect how much it heats up. You probably know that the darker the color is, the better it is at absorbing light. So black will absorb more light than a white car will. Um, that means that the light energy, whether it's infrared or visible or ultraviolet, gets absorbed uh, more readily by that black, which heats it up to then emit it as heat. So it feels hotter than a white car will. Well, if we go to the extreme, um, we can uh, visualize and conceptualize this um, simplified view of something called a black body radiator. Black body radiator is an object that perfectly absorbs everything. Um, so nothing is reflected out. A conceptual black body radiator, we often think of it like an oven or a sphere that has a hole in it that the light can enter, but can never bounce its way back out to leave. Um, so even if it does reflect a little bit, it gets trapped. Um, so any energy that enters in can only do one thing. It can only heat up the object. Um, it can't be emitted by reflecting it back out. Instead, it just heats up as you add more and more energy to it. Now, it's possible to get pretty close. These days, there are certain black paints that are known as like black 2.0 and black 3.0 or Vanta Black, or these different paint companies that are experiencing or trying to create the most absorbent black color possible. And they're able to get pretty close to, to a black body radiator absorbing close to like 99% of the energy. But to get a full black body radiator, you have to absorb everything. Now, we can um, talk about different objects based on how close they are to this idealized black body radiator. And since nothing is going to be perfect, um, we can use a value that we call emissivity to tell us how close to a black body radiator we can approximate. Um, and usually the hotter it is, the closer it becomes to that approximation because uh, it is just taking in and absorbing that energy and emitting it out as heat. So here, if you look on the, the side, uh, a black body is something that totally absorbs everything and then re-emits it as heat. A shiny body, it bounces everything off. That's total reflection. And a gray body, which most things are, will absorb some heat and re-emit it. And then some will be reflected out. Now, this value will always be between zero and one. One being a perfect black body radiator and zero being a perfect shiny object that reflects all the energy back. The sun or any star, we are going to make an approximation and assume that, that is one. We are going to assume black body radiation for a sun. And that, that approximation is actually pretty close um, to what we see in nature. Now, the Earth doesn't absorb everything. It reflects quite a bit. That's why we see the Earth. Uh, the sun's light can reflect off it. And the Earth absorbs still about 0.6% of that energy. So its emissivity is 0.6. 0.6 or 60% of the energy from the sun that hits the earth gets absorbed and turn it, it turns into heat energy or thermal energy that can be re-emitted back out to space in the infrared part of the spectrum. There is a relationship to help us uh, figure out how these things are related. Um, the relationship is called Stefan Boltzmann's law. Uh, and this is the equation here. P is equal to E, emissivity times sigma, which is a, a constant, Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the surface area of the object, times the temperature raised to the fourth power. So let's define these. P is power. Power is measured in watts. E, we just saw, is emissivity. 
Um, unless you're told otherwise, assume it's one, um, because most of the cases that we are going to be calculating for this is for, I guess, star or the sun, where the emissivity has this assumed value of one. Um, sigma here is Stefan Boltzmann constant. Uh, that is always going to be 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth. That is given to you in the data booklet. You'll have that in a list of constants. You don't have to memorize it. A is a surface area. Now, here's where it gets a little trickier because you're not given the equation for surface area. We've often seen surface area or area being used as a circle, but here it's an object. It's a three-dimensional thing. And most of the time, that three-dimensional object is going to be a sphere. So it is useful to review what the surface area uh, equation is to calculate the surface area of the sphere. If you don't remember it, one of my favorite tricks to do this is by using an orange or a clementine to actually prove this with a pretty rudimentary uh, bit of math. All right, I've got an orange here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and trace this orange. Get a rough sketch of its diameter. <laughs> So I traced this orange four times. Now I'm going to go ahead and peel this orange uh, and see what happens with that peel. As you can see, uh, the peel of the orange, the orange being roughly a sphere, uh, has a surface area that is approximately four times the, the surface area of just a circle of the same radius of that orange. So we can see with that, that the surface area of a sphere is about four times the surface area of a circle of the same radius. So four times pi r squared, four pi r squared. Some of you might remember like our volume of a sphere, that four thirds pi r cubed. Be careful, don't get that confused. Uh, in this case, surface area of a sphere is four times just the area of the circle. All right, our final measurement here is T, as a capital T, that is the absolute temperature. It is very important here that the absolute temperature is measured in Kelvin. Um, if it is in Celsius, you must convert it because you need a zero point here that results in zero power being emitted. So if you are emitting energy outward, um, based on its temperature, zero temperature would emit no energy at all. Zero degrees Celsius, where water freezes, is still actually emitting energy. Um, it still has heat waves being emitted, even though we experience and think of it as being cold. It is cold relative to us, but relative to absolute zero, it certainly has heat. And it's able to produce that energy, sending it outward. Um, so you must have absolute zero be your zero point must be in Kelvin. All right, with that in mind, we can do a calculation here. A star has a radius of 8.3 times 10 to the seventh meters and a surface temperature of 7,500 degrees Celsius. Calculate the power that it emits. All right, this um, it can be gone through one step at a time. We're going to assume that all of that energy is emitted. It's going to have an emissivity of one. The earth was 0.6, which means only 60% of the energy was emitted here, uh, all of it, 100%. Sigma is a constant that was given to us in the data booklet. Here we can calculate the area, surface area. Remember that's four pi r squared. The radius is given to us here for that star. And we can calculate that total surface area of the sphere in square meters. And then we need to find the temperature. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. Right now it's in Celsius, so we need to add 273 degrees to that. In the grand scheme of things is not going to make a huge difference. Your number will be off, but not by a lot uh, in the scale of these temperatures. That offset isn't quite as big as it is for, say, room temperature, 23 versus uh, 296. It's a pretty big difference. All right, here's our equation. We can take all of these values, plug it in. Be really careful here because... This temperature is raised to the power of four. That means the temperature has a huge impact on the amount of power that is being produced. Ultimately, we get 1.79 times 10 to the 25th watts. It's a huge amount of power being emitted in all directions by this star.
thanks to Stefan Boltzmann's law. So this relationship helps us predict how much power that star is able to produce from just uh, an example here looking at its temperature. All right, a big thing that you will be asked to do in the IB world is to look at a proportionality. Um, so a very common type of question is comparing two scenarios and just figure out what is the ratio or how much more is it? What percentage higher? So how much more heat energy is radiated from an 80 degree cup of water compared to a 20 degree cup of water? That temperature is in Celsius. Well, here's how I go about that. In this case, it feels like you don't have enough information. You don't know an emissivity value. You don't aren't given even how big it is. You don't know its area, but we know that it's the same cup of water, or in this case, we'll assume that it's the same cup of water if it's not told to us. So we want to compare their power, and we know that a lot of things are constant. So I'm going to set up a relationship that can compare these two. It's important that when I'm doing this, I'm comparing their temperatures in Kelvin and not their temperatures in Celsius, because you'll get a huge difference uh, in those two different variables. So I'm going to set up a ratio here, the power of the hotter one divided by the power of the, the colder one. Now, we know that power is equal to emissivity times Stefan-Boltzmann constant times the surface area times the temperature raised to the power of four. Well, here, uh, a lot of these are going to be the same before and after. Emissivity, sigma, and surface area are all going to be the same before and after, which means that my ratio of P1 to P2 is the same as the ratio of T1 uh, to the fourth power divided by T2 to the fourth power. Well, I know what those values are, 353 to the fourth and 290. 3 to the 4th gives me about 2.1 times more power. So that's a ratio of like 2.1 to 1. Um, that here, you really need to look at how much the temperature changes in Kelvin uh, and then raise that to the power of 4 to figure out how that, how that changes, the proportionality of that power change. All right, the last piece that you need to know about all of this is how does this energy get transformed into an energy that we see either with an infrared camera or in the visible part of the spectrum? Because what you see with a star is actually the star glowing because it's gotten so hot. You've maybe experienced that with metal getting so hot that it starts to glow in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, well, when a black body radiator is heated up, it emits a range of different wavelengths that are there. Um, and there's actually a huge story in the world of science uh, that there were a couple different ways that it was predicted that this energy would be emitted. And the primary prediction stated that as you got to a shorter and shorter wavelength or a higher and higher frequency, a heated object will emit basically an infinite amount of ultraviolet light. Um, but whenever they measured it and passed it through a diffraction grating or a prism to see the different wavelengths that appeared, they noticed that it always made a shape kind of like this. It fell off. Then there was a certain peak, um, but it didn't keep going up forever. And that's given name. It's called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and the, the understanding that led them to figuring out how to make this match with the actual experimental data is what led us to understanding quantized energy and quantum uh, physics in the first place. So... This is kind of the, the first place that quantum physics was born out of. Now, what you need to know about this particular graph is to understand how this spectrum is related to the different temperatures that are produced. Right now, I have heat that is not zero degrees uh, Kelvin. I am not at absolute zero, which means I am emitting heat in the infrared part of the spectrum. But if you take something and heat it up enough, it's heat. Uh, gives you a wavelength that's in the visible part of the spectrum. You've maybe seen this with an old electric stove or even with a toaster. All right, here I am in my kitchen to show you how a toaster is going to glow if it heats up enough. So here I have a toaster. I'm going to push it down a little bit, let it start to heat up. There are a couple coils inside the toaster that are set up so that when they have enough current running through them, they start to heat up. Now, if it raises above a certain temperature, that heat actually starts to create a wavelength that glows in the visible part of the spectrum. So if I flip my camera here, 
towards the toaster, you can see that inside those wires are glowing. Um, and I could actually take that frequency, that wavelength that they are glowing at, and calculate exactly how hot the different coils are inside the toaster. Pretty awesome. Now with a toaster, we can see it glowing like that. But um, if we got it even hotter, we would see that instead of those red part of the spectrum, it would start to turn like orange and yellow and ultimately white. White isn't necessarily a hotter light. Uh, it's not a hotter color. It's all the colors together. So what's happening here is the infrared part of the spectrum. We're going to see part of that. Um, and the first part that starts to kind of go into the visible is going to be red. That's the color that we're going to start seeing first. And if we heat it up more and more and more, that peak wavelength that we see starts to shift over into the visible part of the spectrum and ultimately have a fair amount of all the different colors, which eventually turns it white. And this peak wavelength can be found based on the temperature. Um, so this is one of the, the predictions that matched the experimental results. It's called Vienne's displacement law. And it basically says that the, uh, the wavelength, the maximum peak wavelength that shows up in this spectrum of light uh, is related to the temperature by this constant, 2.9 times 10 to the negative third divided by whatever the temperature is in Kelvin will give you a maximum wavelength. Now notice here that the hotter the object is, the more that that wavelength starts to shift to be lower and lower in its wavelength. A low wavelength actually means high energy um, because the energy, the waves are being squished together, which means you have a higher frequency. So we can use this to actually do a calculation. The sun has been measured to have a surface temperature of about 5,780 degrees Kelvin. And I can use this equation to calculate what is the maximum wavelength of that emitted sunlight. We see it as basically being white light, but if you pass it through a, a, a prism, you'll see that there's different intensities through the different colors of light. So here, if I plug that temperature in Kelvin into this equation, I get uh, a value for wavelength of 5.02 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Well, that's about 502 nanometers. In my spectrum for visible light, 502 nanometers is right here in the green part of the spectrum. So we don't see green because we see all the different colors combined together to give us white. But the biggest uh, color in there, the highest amplitude, is actually green light. All right, uh, an old IB question, and one that you will need to be able to recognize here, is looking at uh, two bodies that are basically black bodies at different temperatures. A uh, body of Y is higher temperature than X, which of the following shows the black body spectrum for two bodies? Well, two things change as you increase the temperature. Remember, Y is the hotter one here. You're going to emit more light, um, so more light is emitted out, which means you're going to have a higher intensity for Y than you are for X. So we can basically ignore uh, option A and option D, because in that case, X was higher. So we know Y is going to be higher. And the other thing that's important is that the more energy, the smaller the wavelength, which results in a higher frequency. So the, the peak starts to shift over to the left, which gives us choice C. All right, so from this video, you should be able to know the difference between conduction, convection, and radiation. And then all this discussion about black body radiators, emissivity, and then these two equations, Stefan Boltzmann law and Vienna's displacement law, um, talking about how the temperature can give you the amount of power being radiated and what colors or what wavelength is most present in that spectrum.